Stephen Shu. Welcome to Hidden Forces. Great to be here. It's great having you on, Stephen. So I was doing a little bit of uh, independent research into your background. Looks like you grew up you grew up mixed, half Taiwanese, half mainlander. But uh, I don't know that uh, the folks over in Ames, Iowa, where you grew up, were able to really make that distinction. Tell us a little bit about um, your background, because you have a really interesting one. Your father was a professor of engineering in in Iowa. He was an immigrant, as well as I think your mom was also an immigrant, but she was from her family was from Taiwan, and your father was from mainland China. So tell us a little bit about you, who you are, how you grew up. Yeah, my dad came to this country in 1948. Uh, so that was before the communists took over China. In 1949, the Civil War ended and the nationalist government relocated, fled mainland China, and relocated to Taiwan. And that's how my mom's family ended up there. My mom's father was a general in the KMT <clears throat> and they're related by marriage to Chiang Kai-shek. So uh, interesting family. Um, my brother and I grew up in Ames, Iowa. We were both born there. So we're native Iowans. And my father uh, was a professor at uh, Iowa State University. His specialty was aerospace engineering, fluid dynamics. So did you feel more Taiwanese or mainland Chinese, or was that not really a distinction that you guys made at that time? It wasn't really a big distinction. We were definitely anti-communist, though. I think that's the main distinction. So my father was an officer in the KMT also, um, and actually taught briefly at the um, military academy for the KMT. He taught pilots, uh, aerodynamics. And so very anti-communist. My father's family that was still in China after he left, uh, they suffered a lot during the Cultural Revolution. So in the 1970s, when I was a little kid and the Cultural Revolution was going on, most Americans didn't even know what that was. Uh, but my dad was telling me all these terrible stories about what was happening to his family and how how horrible the communists were. So uh, I wonder, like, what was that like for you growing up in Iowa as a Chinese, a family of Chinese immigrants? Were there other Chinese kids around? Because Iowa, when you think of Iowa, what you think of is a lot of white people. So yeah. were there Chinese people? Were there Asian people? Were there other people that looked like you? There were a very small number of East and South Asians at my high school uh, and also growing up in the school system. Usually those families, their parents were at the university or at the national lab there. So, uh, you know, it... it Ames is an unusual town because there's one high school and a um, pretty good chunk of the families are associated with the university there. So it wasn't like being in rural Iowa or something. Um, we had a very wonderful all-American childhood, uh, really great. That was a time when assimilation was really the norm. So everybody was like, yeah, everybody's an American. And even mm -hmm. if your family came from a different country, you're your big aspirations to grow up to be a, an American and uh, very different from now where people want to kind of, and maybe it's healthier, maybe it's not, but people really want to hang on to their cultural identity uh, from their, you know, ancestral home. Yeah. I, I wonder, I don't know that it's healthier. I think that uh, of course it's wonderful to celebrate your national, your heritage. Like I'm, I'm a family of immigrants. I come from a family of immigrants I have Greek citizenship and American citizenship. I love Greece. I've been there every year since I was a child. I spent months at a time there. I uh, I love I love it, um, and it's a, an important part of my personal identity. But as I've gotten older, I've come to more deeply appreciate the melding pot that is the United States and how I feel like that is really one of the things that sets us apart. And it's a, a, a source of tremendous renewal in our culture. So I don't know, you, you were going to say something? Well, I was going to say, it's, uh, there's a great thing about America, which is what you were just mentioning, which is that, you know, I'm, I'm the child of Chinese immigrants. You may be the child of Greek immigrants, but, you know, we're totally comfortable hanging out together. Um, you know, I, I think that's a pretty unique thing about America, actually.
Well, you know, you and I grew up, I mean, we're not exactly the same age. Uh, you're, you fall in the Gen X cohort. I fall in the millennial cohort, but I'm a very, very old millennial born in 1981. Our two generations still grew up in a time where, I mean, you probably had this experience. I had it certainly growing up in New York where people were teased by their racial backgrounds, whether you were Chinese, black, Greek, Jewish, yep. but there was a level of of permissibility around that. I mean, there was a certain sense of like, what's a red line, you know? But there was a certain amount of that that was just normal. Like, it, at least among boys, I don't feel like you really saw that with girls, but there was a sense of that kind of, um, that kind of talk. And I, you know, like one area where I remember seeing it a few years ago was in the movie Gran Torino, when um, Clint Eastwood goes to the barber and they're like insulting each other. And so, you know, and especially in New York where, identity groups were so central, like you had all these different groups and and it's it was one way to kind of identify and also uh, have a sense of security in your own in-group. So yeah, things change, the world changes. You mentioned uh, that your dad was a, an aerospace engineer. He must have been a pretty smart guy. Yeah, you know, my dad went to college when he was 16. And um, when the, uh, in that era, because of the, he went to school during World War II. He went to college during World War II, and during that era, the Chinese were occupying the eastern, the uh, the eastern seaboard of China, where he grew up. The Chinese government moved to the top universities all the way to the interior of the country, a place called Kunming, which is uh, really in the far southwest of China. So my dad told me stories about. Uh, oh, and and in that era, so you know, you had to take these college entrance exams. So he was admitted to Tsinghua, which is the top technical university in China today. It's now back in Beijing, where it used to be, but during the war years, it was in Kunming. And he told me all these stories about how you can imagine, in a war-ravaged, uh, you know, pretty undeveloped country, to travel from the eastern seaboard of China all the way across the country to Kunming to go to college was just an unbelievable experience. It took like weeks for him to make that trip. And, um, you know, and there were bandits and, you know, all kinds of warlords, all kinds of crazy things. So uh, totally different era, but uh, he attended that school, which is a very elite school. And a lot of the most famous uh, scientists uh, from that era in China attended that university and were there uh, all together in, during those war years. So I imagine academics, was prioritized in your home growing up, not just because your dad was an aerospace engineer, but also because you guys were immigrants and you were Asian immigrants, like fits all the stereotypes. What influence did did, um, did your father have on you, both by the example of his life and also in terms of, you know, his teachings and how did that affect your your direction, your career? direction and your interest areas as a child and then as a as a young adult? Well, number one, my dad was a Confucian. So that's a certain like philosophical view of uh, the way that you have to conduct yourself. And so he had a very kind of strict kind of code of how he himself should behave. Um, on the other hand, I grew up in the 70s. And so like that was a time in America where parents totally let their kids roam free, like the mm. kind of shit that we got away with like in the summer like we might disappear in the morning and our parents had no idea where we were we could be anywhere around town and then we just were supposed to be back for dinner so totally different from the kind of helicopter parenting that people do now so it was a weird mix of my dad wearing like um, polyester slacks and a leisure suit that was like you know popular in the 70s but he had this confucian personal philosophy and it was the 1970s so it's all those things mixed together in in my childhood um, now he wasn't, my parents didn't really push us academically. Like we were encouraged to do well in school. Um, I just developed an interest in things like math and physics and computer science when I was pretty young. And I actually had the experience of getting to a point when I was still in high school where I was doing more advanced math and physics than my father understood. So I was a little bit irritated that like when I wanted to understand some point in quantum mechanics or complex analysis, my dad actually didn't necessarily know uh, that stuff as well as I did at that age. So mm. um, it, it, it was a very unique experience. 
That's so interesting. That reminds me of when I was a kid. My dad actually did know more than me. <laughs> and I remember he uh, taught me a lot of things. I, I asked him one time, I had a long conversation with him when I was a really little kid about astronomy. And and he, um, he used some fruits and some pencils and some flashlights to explain to me how the rotation of the planets and the ellipsis and all that stuff created shadows on the earth and the moon, et cetera. And that stuff's fascinating. I mean, it's great to grow up with someone that is knowledgeable. In your case, it's a little different. I mean, it's not that your dad wasn't knowledgeable, but yeah, anyway, you know what I mean. Um, I, I want to encourage listeners to check out our episode with Gene Twangy on, uh, on generations. And because we talked about generation X and specifically the anecdotes that Stephen raises and also our wonderful episode with Chuck Klosterman on the 1990s. Cause Chuck is also a Gen Xer. We talk a little bit about that. I, I, you know, as I grow older, I'm, I become more and more fond of my memories of that time where you had so much more freedom and there was a sense of danger lurking out there, but not the kind of danger that elicited in you a, a, a phobia, a set of phobias, but rather one that you had to contend with, you know, it was part of being an adult going out there into the world still restrained somewhat. And that's what was reflected in some of these movies and what, um, the that movie Stranger Things uh, tried the show Stranger Things tried to really capture. You know, it's also fascinating how like we had the version of Stranger Things growing up, which was Wonder Years and other stuff like that, right? <laughs> or like Stand yeah. by Me. You know, yep. it's always interesting how that works. So you yeah. graduated from uh, from Caltech in 1986 as a 19 year old, which suggests that you probably started Caltech unless you finished it in a year. You probably started a little bit younger. You were saying that you were doing stuff at a younger age. Uh, that your father didn't understand. And then you you went and you got a, a PhD in physics from UC Berkeley five years later. So you're pretty much done with your academic life by your mid-20s. Um, what did you major in Caltech? And what led you to pursue a PhD in physics? And how did that, walk me through that progression from when you were a high school student to how you ended up with a PhD at, by the age of 24? Well, I, I took my first course at the university at Iowa State University in computer science when I was 12. And by the time I was finishing high school at 16, I was already spending half the day at the university and I was taking junior senior level courses at Iowa State in, in math and physics. And so I was somewhat accelerated. That was very unusual at the time. So uh, I think I was the first kid in my high school that was allowed to do that, to like split time between the university and the high school. Now it's, I think, more common. Um, I just got interested. I was, you know, I was very lucky because there was a kid one year older than me who also children of professors who uh, was also interested in math and physics. And so we were very, very close friends. We would spend hours like on a, on a Friday night discussing you know, some theorems in mathematics or something. And uh, he ended up uh, graduating first in his class from Princeton. He was the valedictorian of his class in 86 at Princeton and then did his PhD in math at MIT. So he and I had been friends for a long time. And um, really that friendship was, I think, very uh, impactful on my growing up and my, he was a year older than me, um, but impactful on, you know, what I wanted to do later in my life. I, my hero uh, back in high school was a guy called Richard Feynman. And I sort of went to Caltech because Richard Feynman was a professor at Caltech. And so I, my, my uh, desire was to be a theoretical physicist like Richard Feynman. And it, it, it's, it's turned out that I've actually, the specialty within theoretical physics that I've chosen is very similar to the kinds of things that he worked on when he was alive. So he, he's kind of a, uh, and was an idol for me and an inspiration. So when you finished your PhD, what, uh, what, what did you want to do at that point? Like how, how did your career progress from there? I was super lucky because, um, there is a, an organization at Harvard called the society of fellows. And, uh, it's a very unique organization uh, one of the early presidents of Harvard, I think it was, could have been Lowell. Um, one of the early presidents of Harvard thought, oh, this PhD program, like there was a time when 
almost nobody in America got a PhD. And then there was a time when it became like the standard way to, to advance your academic career. But I think it was Lowell. Lowell thought, oh, this PhD kind of program is not right for quote, geniuses. And so he wanted to create some alternative to the PhD where they would just only allow quote, geniuses into the society of fellows as junior fellows. And those people would be given complete freedom to do whatever they wanted for three years. And they would be not supervised, but they would be put in close contact with the senior fellows at Harvard who were selected from the very top professors at Harvard. So there's a strange little organization at Harvard called the Harvard Society of Fellows. Hmm. And in my era, they would elect, the senior fellows would elect eight junior fellows a year they would put you up at Harvard. I had an apartment uh, overlooking the Charles at Harvard in Dunster House, and they would fund you for three years. You can do whatever you want. Um, so I, I just had that incredible experience. And there was a formal dinner, all of us wearing not tuxedos, but formal attire. Actually, at the Christmas dinner, we would wear form, we would wear tuxedos, but but formal attire every Monday night in the dining room of the Society of Fellows, which had its own wine cellar and its own sommelier and all this other stuff. So it was a very uh, unique experience. Um, and I, so I spent uh, three years at Harvard doing that after I finished my PhD. It was quite a change because I had done my whole education on the West Coast, uh, Caltech and Berkeley, and going to like gray Boston was quite a shock for me. Um, and then after that, I, I became a professor at Yale after uh, being at Harvard. So I was kind of an East coaster for a while. So given your background, there must've been plenty of opportunities for the national security state to recruit you from a very young age. Did you have any run-ins? Uh, did you try to get recruited? Did you ever consider, uh, doing work explicitly for the government? Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned this because, um, one thing it's harder for young people today to understand is that and maybe for you as well, because you said you were born in 91. 81, 81. 80, 81. Oh, okay. Maybe you remember some of this. So I grew up during the Cold War, the height of the Cold War. And being a precocious kid, if you had asked me when I was 10 or 12, what, what, is it likely that we're going to have a nuclear war? I could have given you chapter and verse on the SS-20 mobile, mobile launch system that the Soviets had developed and all this other stuff. So if you're a kid who's interested in physics, it's the height of the Cold War and you're interested in technology, of course, you're following all this stuff. You know all about uh, how an atomic bomb works, what a you know fusion bomb, hydrogen bomb is, et cetera, et cetera. So I was interested in all this stuff. And when I was in high school, Ronald Reagan became president and started pushing something called Star Wars, which is missile defense. And there was a huge controversy within the physics community because it, from some very first principles analysis, it was kind of clear that missile defense with the technology we had at that time was not going to work. And so there were a lot of physicists who, who spoke out against missile defense, Star Wars saying, this is a huge waste of money. It's a boondoggle. Later I met, for example, I had uh, PhD students who had been trained in Russia, in the Soviet system in Russia. And they told me that, you know, even though they also knew Star Wars was not really going to work, the Soviet leadership didn't know that because they weren't science, they weren't physicists. So they were actually very scared by Star Wars. And in a way, Star Wars did work because it intimidated the Soviet leadership and did partially lead to Gorbachev and basically that, that system basically eventually giving up on itself. So I lived through all that. And so I was interested in all that. When I graduated from college, one of the job offers I had was with the Institute for Defense Analysis, which is a top secret place in Princeton. Um, and the job was to work on X-ray lasers, which are a component uh, to the Star Wars system. So I almost went in that direction, but I was more interested in kind of pure than pure research rather than applied research. But even today, like if you listen to my podcast, you'll you'll hear me talking to weapon scientists talking about, uh, you know, hypersonic missile technology, stuff like that. So I'm still interested in that kind of thing, but I didn't ever get fully pulled into the national security state. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, for people that don't know much about the strategic defense initiative or star Wars, as it was called, 
the, it, it's easy for them to miss how disruptive it was to the game theory of mutually assured disruption, destruct, destruction, because it it introduced the possibility that the United States could conduct a first strike and be safe from any kind of retaliatory response by the, <clears throat> the Soviet Union. Um, I think it was... I'm blanking now what I was going to, there was something that made me think of David Goldman, but I think who we both know and who's also been on your podcast, but David also, ah, right, David, it was about SDI and David talked about how there were all these downstream ancillary benefits from SDI. And this is something I've been hammering on about on the show for a long time and going back at least as far as um, my episode with Bill Janeway, who wrote a book called uh, Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy. And we He's also- an old friend of mine. Yeah, he's well, he's he's brilliant. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, I had him in studio back in the day, and one of the things that I still remember about Bill is that at that age, so this was 2018, he I guess he was in his 70s. Boy, did he have a lot of energy and a lot of spunk and spirit. Um, I remember he corrected me on something, and he was very quick to point out that I was wrong, and he just kind of jammed his finger in my face. I was like, whoa. This guy, they don't they don't build these guys like this anymore. So anyway, David made that point, and it's so true. And maybe that's an opportunity for something to discuss later on in the show, which is this need for an industrial policy and how the government has a role to play, and that many of our ideas about the need for the government to get out of the way of everything are actually not borne out by the facts uh, and by history. But also David, I was reminded of David because I think he was the one that was saying that when he was a kid, him and his friends would joke about um, – nuclear war on the basketball court and like, you know, who would die first, et cetera. So it was we, definitely. We, in, in my generation, we took it very seriously. So the smart kids at my high school would discuss like, what are the odds that we're going to live to be 25 or something? Because it seemed very plausible that there would actually be a nuclear war, you know? And, and so I think for people living now, they just can't imagine that state of mind. Yeah. So I, I, I could go down this road right now. But actually, let's 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 cap that one. So, when did you get your professor position at Yale? What year? Uh, I must have left Harvard, I think around ninety four or ninety five. Okay. So I was at in New Haven from the mid to late nineties. So when you went to Yale, did you go with the clear intention of making a career in physics? Were you inspired by other people like Feynman? Did you want to make certain breakthroughs? I mean, is that how you saw your career or did you see it kind of like, this is interesting. There's a lot I'll get out of it, but you know, there are other things out there that also interest me and I'm keeping my options open. So there are very few careers that let you, you know, continue learning at a very, very high pace, you know, until your seventies, <laughs> they pay you to do that. They pay you to focus and go very deep into something that you're interested in. Um, there are very few careers. Most people who aspire to that kind of life end up being professors. I mean, there are a few other things you could be, like you could be a researcher at Los Alamos Lab or something like that. But uh, professorship is the usual path for that kind of thing. And that's what I thought I was doing <laughs> when I uh, you know, started my academic career. Um, the weird thing that happened was the internet. So in the late 90s, um, the internet was starting to get bigger and bigger. I mean, I had an email address early on when I was at, starting when I was at Berkeley, but um, the, the, the World Wide Web and all that stuff, as you know, started really in the, the mid to late 90s. And so what happened when I was at Yale was there was a, one of my PhD students who, you know, as is not that unusual for a kid who's doing a PhD in theoretical physics. He had done a triple majors in undergrad. I think he was an electrical engineering, physics, and computer science undergrad major or something like this. And so he and I started looking into internet security because a hacker had broken into the network at Yale. And so we were interested, we got interested in things like packet sniffers. And I realized I had never looked into the actual network architecture, how packet routing works, how TCP IP works, all these low level internet technologies that are basically the plumbing of the web. And this student, Jim and I started getting interested in this. And then we realized like, this is before even the concept of firewall 
existed. Okay, that was not a word that anyone used at that time. Man. And we realized, wait a minute, this wide open internet thing is crazy. Anybody, any hacker can probe the network at Yale from far away. Like we could never catch this guy because we noticed he was he was routing his packets through intermediate other hack machines in different countries. And we realized we're never gonna catch this guy. So um, we realized that there are incredible opportunities in the field of internet security. We got interested in encryption and we ended up deciding, hey, we wanna start a tech company. So that is what caused me to leave Yale, I took a position at the University of Oregon, which is on the West Coast, and which is a, a one hour flight from San Francisco. So by going to the University of Oregon, I thought I can continue doing my research in theoretical physics, but I could also potentially start a tech company. And so Jim and I started a company called SafeWeb. And that was a peer to peer internet anonymizer. So you quite literally got inspiration from the, the hacker. Absolutely. Into your university. One hundred percent. So we we got into um, basically encryption technologies and uh, rerouting of packets and all kinds of stuff like that. And um, SafeWeb. So I was there in the first Internet bubble. I had that experience of raising venture capital and have, we had an office overlooking the bay. We could see both. the We could just we could overlook the Bay Bridge from our office. And um, so we went through all that, sold the company to Symantec. And after that, I went back to academia and I thought, okay, I had my fill of Silicon Valley. Now I'm going to go back and, you know, be a, a monk again. But once you have the, once you've been bitten by the bug and you realize, wait, I now understand the infrastructure, the infrastructure, which at one time really only existed in Silicon Valley, but now it's more widespread throughout the world. The infrastructure, which includes venture capital, engineers and scientists who want to take risk who want to work intensely on teams, that whole thing we now call startup culture. I realized, well, I understand this now because we, we were one of the early startups and we did it. We did it. Um, the next time an interesting idea comes into my head, rather than just like uh, play with it and maybe file a patent with the university patent office or something like that, I know how to build a company around it. Mm. And so there was never, there was no really ever going back because every time I had a really interesting idea, I could call up some venture capitalists or people like this and say, Hey, I've got an interesting idea. Do you want to, do you want to, you know, be in the seed round? And so I kind of uh, have always now been since then been straddling the ac purely academic physics research world and the startup world. So you said you founded the company in 2000, the internet bubble popped in March. Was this, were you guys raising before that? Did you start the company yeah. before that? Yeah, you have an exquisite sense of timing because our first round, we did, of course, at the time, we didn't know this. Okay, so NASDAQ is ramping up like this. And of course, when the bubble is blowing up, it's that's the easiest point it is to raise capital. So we raised our first funding round, or maybe the, the big, bigger, maybe it wasn't our first round, maybe it was a bigger round, but we, we raised a round. And then just right after that, if you look back in time, you realize that was the peak of NASDAQ hmm. and the bubble popped immediately after that. But when, when the bubble first popped and things were going down, you weren't sure whether it was really going to go down or whether it could maybe come back up again. So in retrospect, we lived through the crash. We were operating our startup during the crash, but we didn't really quite know it for sure mm -hmm. at the time. So, yeah, you and along, along with another, a bunch of companies like PayPal or the the PayPal and X.com, but also Napster. I mean, Napster, those guys were right there with you and they were also running a file sharing network, you know, yeah. kind of something, something similar there uh, in terms of like, you know, having to co-opt other computers and using them to actually, you know, enable the, the, we, the service that you were providing. We thought of adding a payment function to our thing. And then if we had done that, we might have been like that. We might have been on a collision course with the PayPal guys, but we, we didn't really go that far. You know why? Because we looked into the banking regulations. We said, you can't do this. It's illegal. Hmm. And those so, guys were like, yeah, we this is illegal, but we're going to do it. So, <laughs> You know, fascinating, right? Like that was um, there was some friction there to adopting that attitude that has since become just the modus operandi across all of Silicon Valley. Uh, this was like a time. So you grew up, you experienced the internet from the ground up and your company inst was instilled and, and sort of embodied many of the foundational, the foundational ethos of, of the internet, of privacy, of freedom. 
What was your vision about the direction of internet freedom and, and society during that time? And, and what was your sense of what the long-term impact of the internet would be? And how have things shaken out um, Did, in retrospect relative to what Dimitri, you imagined? Dimitri, you are such an insightful interviewer. So, so this question is a great question because we had a whole worldview and other people like us, technologists like us at the time had a similar worldview that we everything would eventually be encrypted. It would be a kind of peer to peer thing that lived like as a layer on top of the internet. So no one would control it. And one of the things being a Chinese American, I thought, oh, you know what? One of the uses of all this technology we're building will be to make sure that the internet in China is free, which will help them develop a healthy democracy. So that, that was literally the kind of stuff we were thinking about. One of the investors in our company was the CIA venture fund called Incutel. Mm. And one of the things we, we built them some bespoke technologies that CIA could use to basically communicate surreptitious, like communicate, but make it look like ordinary internet, internet traffic, but also to make uh, a kind of unblockable encrypted network so people in China could access uh, stuff outside of the great firewall and that was uh distributed like some of the stuff that we did was in collaboration with voice of america and also um uh, the national endowment for democracy now some people even today do not realize that national endowment for democracy is a front for the cia but i will tell you as someone who worked with cia who worked with those organizations to try to actually push information into China. Uh, I shouldn't say this because next time I go to China, maybe I'll get arrested or something. But but that's what that's part of what we were doing in that era in the early 2000s. And um, so on the one hand, yes, Ned is basically CIA. Anybody who tells you different doesn't know what they're talking about. And number two, we were actually involved in that. Now, ultimately, the Great Firewall of China wasn't defeated by some hacker peer-to-peer -peer technologies, but that that's the kind of stuff we were interested in at the time. I'm sure that made you very popular with the Chinese Communist Party and the leadership of, over in Beijing. It, it's very funny because the first time I went to mainland China, I thought, oh, maybe they're going to stop me at the, uh, you know, uh, immigration and, and deport me or something, but nothing happened. They didn't really care. So, <laughs> and I've been there many times. Since, so, well, well, that's good. So, okay. So you, uh, you got a PhD in physics. You started. You got a professorship in physics, beginning at Yale. Then you moved to Oregon because you got. You wanted to be close to the internet boom. You got in right before the bubble burst, and you got an exit a couple of years later in two thousand and three to Symantec. What did? What happened after that? Like, how did your life uh, shake up? You went back to academia. How did you manage sort of the the bug bite with um, your your sort of trajectory in physics? Yeah, very interesting. So, you know, at this point, I'm in my early to mid 30s. I'm a tenured professor and a multimillionaire. And so like, wow, that's and pretty I good. I just right? want to say thought... a multimillionaire then was very <laughs> impressive. People at that age just weren't millionaires. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, and so I thought, wow, OK, everything's great. Right. And I went back and actually really focused on my physics research um, you know, uh, and really enjoyed, I actually really enjoyed living in Eugene, Oregon is a, is a, is a really beautiful place. If you like trees and wilderness, I mean, the whole state is empty. It's like one giant national mm. park. basically. So, um, I just really enjoyed that. And the strange thing that happened to me was I was at a conference at UC Santa Barbara on black hole information theory and a headhunter calls me a headhunter, an academic headhunter. And I'm like, are you sure you have the right Steve Shue? And she said, yes, I'm working for Michigan State University. They're searching for a vice president for research to run their huge research enterprise. And they want someone with Silicon Valley experience because they want to build up the commercialization arm of their technology practice at the university. And so the president has said she wants a really strong science researcher who also has a background in entrepreneurship or you know tech innovation. And, and the, the headhunter said to me, as far as I can tell, you're like one of five people you know, in the country or something that satisfied those desiderata. So that's why I'm calling you. 
And so that I ended up moving from Oregon to Michigan State back in 2012. Okay, good. So this kind of brings us kind of in the ballpark of um, what I'm one of the subject areas that I was really interested in tackling with you, and that is genomics or genomic science. So you're the co founder of a company called Genomic Prediction. I think it was you, you guys founded this company in 2017. Is that the date Correct. I have in my head? Okay, yeah. so 2017, you were obviously must have been interested in the subject beforehand. So how, what, how did you walk me through that? First of all, is it fair to say that you're just a generally curious guy, that there are a lot yes. of things that you study on the side, and this was one of them? Yeah. What made you focus on this one, and how did your interest in this run parallel to the work you were doing at MSU in your role as a, as a senior director? What was the title? As a senior vice president for research? Yeah, vice president for research, um, research and in innovation. Um, I started getting interested in genomics. Okay, well, just to tell you the full story. When I went to Caltech, uh, they were already telling us as undergrads, hey, you know, physics is so mature. Most of everything's been figured out in physics. The most dynamic area you guys should be working in, they were telling this to like freshmen is molecular biology. We've got recumbent DNA. We've got all this amazing stuff. If you look at the deep history of the subject, uh, molecular biology, Caltech played a very important role in starting it. Linus Pauling, Max Delbruck, um, Watson trained there. Um, so uh, they were very aware of all of this stuff about molecular biology. And we were told, oh yeah, that's what you should be studying. That's the most exciting dynamic part of science at that moment in time. And I remember taking some classes in molecular biology when I was there. And I realized like, okay, it is changing very fast. They figured out a lot of stuff. However, that was well before they had even sequenced one human genome. So that was in the eighties. And I had already studied the mathematical theory of evolution. Like how does natural selection actually operate on a population? And there were lots of interesting questions related to that theory, the mathematical theory of what Darwin originally had thought of was it was made mathematical by another guy called Fisher. Is this fall and, the uh, category of bioinformatics or computational so later, biology? So bi like where does this fall? Yeah. So bioinformatics means the study of things like genomes. So data generated by biological processes. Um, is that like, a, is, a, is another way of putting that like you're sort of viewing biology through an informational theory lens? Yes, yes. So so Fisher introduced this notion, the idea of information as being central, uh, Fisher and others, uh, as being central to life and biology. And so I was aware of those things, but I could look at the technical tools they had in the 80s in molecular biology. And while they were advancing very fast, the core questions I was interested in, I knew they were not going to answer in the near term. But then flash forward into back when I was at Oregon, I realized that the cost, so the, the Human Genome Project had completed around 2000. And I was back at Oregon after selling my startup. And I realized, wait a minute, the, the cost to genotype a person is falling like crazy. It's falling at this super double exponential rate. It's much faster than Moore's Law, actually. And so I realized if that field, if they continue that progress, we will be drowning in data from human genomes. And so I got reinterested in genomics, DNA, molecular biology. At that time, I started spending 10, sort of like Google has 10% or they used to have 10% time for their engineers to do like interesting projects. Same kind of thing in theoretical physics. Like you may be mostly focused on quantum fields and black holes, but you might say, oh, can I just apply some of this stuff in some other area, like maybe to encryption or, you know, whatever. So I started doing stuff in what you would call bioinformatics or computational genomics. I was working for a while with a huge lab in China called BGI, which used to be called the Beijing Genomics Institute. That was all before I moved to Michigan State. The main problem I wanted to solve was if you give me the data from a very big population of people, say you genotype 1 million people, and then you measure everything you can measure about those people. Like, does this person have diabetes? What color are their eyes? How tall are they? 
What's their IQ? Those are called phenotypes. And the question I was interested in is if you have enough data, can you build an algorithm that can predict phenotype from purely genotype or DNA information? Because as we know, identical twins are very concordant in many ways, eye color, height. They tend to also have very similar IQs. So the idea that the DNA plays an important role in determining the phenotype of the organism, but there's a some kind of code there that we need to decipher that allows us to, given the DNA as an input, the function outputs the phenotype information for that organism. That to me is the fundamental unsolved problem in biology, at least from an information perspective. And so I realized that the data would be available to attack that problem before too long. And so around 2010 ish is when I started getting interested in this. And I, I um, uh, started working with BGI. I gave a talk at Google, <laughs> which is still on the internet, like from 2010 or 2011, where I recruited people with extremely high IQs to be genotyped and they were going to be genotyped at BGI. So I, I started getting into this stuff back then. The company you're referencing didn't get started until 2017. So, so again, to summarize for people, you, you became interested in genomic variation or another way of putting that is the way in which our genetic inheritances, our genotypes inform our phenotypes, the phenomenology of our biology, how we present right. to the world. Um, right. I want to actually, this is a good opportunity to remind the audience that I did an episode with Eric Schott, who is the founder of Semaphore and also holds a position at uh, the Icon Institute. I think Another it was- friend the of mine. Yeah, he's brilliant. And that was a brilliant episode. Uh, again, I, off the top of my head, I, if I remember cor correctly, Eric is not just an MD. He's not just a medical doctor who went to medical school, but he also has a PhD in pure mathematics. Um, real genius and- um, fascinating conversation and a useful one because it'll it gets into the weeds on some of the stuff that we're going to probably go over kind of skip over here but we might might as well actually just take this opportunity so let's just kind of do a taxonomy real quick for people that don't know what we're talking about here um what are the important thing important categories to understand here when we're talking about genomics you know like dna nucleotides, base pairs, chromosomes, like what are the important categories if you could just summarize this for people as we move along? Right, so as you probably recall or may not recall from your high school biology class, every cell in your body carries the same DNA information. There are about 3 billion base pairs which make up that information and it's split among 23 chromosomes, okay? From the physicist's perspective, you can just say like there's some list of numbers that tell you which letters A, you know, G, A, C, T, you know, you have at different places along your each strand of your chromosomes. And you can just have a list of one to three billion of base pairs. Right. And that's it. That's the information from which you are constructed. And, um, you know, so this map between. This is the list of the base pairs for Dimitri. And then here's a bunch of phenotypes for Dimitri, like how tall is he? What color is his hair? What color are his eyes? Does he have light skin? Does he have dark skin? You know, is he left-handed? What's his IQ score? You know, there's all these, uh, what's his risk for uh, prostate cancer? You know, there, there, there's a bunch of phenotypes that in an, the ultimate limit of this science, you would be able to predict uh, to some accuracy uh, those phenotype values given as input each of the 3 billion values of the specific base pairs that form Dimitri's uh, DNA. And um, DNA or genes rather are definitionally sequences of DNA that can vary in length that are responsible for producing a very specific protein, That's which correct. is transcribed by RNA and produced in the body. Um, correct. Now, one of the things that got resolved just in the last five, 10 years is that for a long time, so that 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 story you just described is the, the big synthesis that was worked out by people like Crick and Watson that, you know, DNA codes for proteins and those proteins are produced and do things in your cell. But um, there's a lot of DNA in between 
where the protein is coded for. So the, the technical term gene means the actual region that codes for a specific protein. But then there are all these other base pairs in between. Uh, and the question for a long time is, what are those things doing? Mm. Like, is that just junk DNA or is that important stuff? And of course, like it turns out all that stuff is doing other important things like controlling the expression or uh, protein, you know, the level of which a particular protein is produced, um, all kinds of other things. And as we do this bioinformatics or computational genomics, we are starting to learn like, oh, this little particular base pair, which is outside but close to the gene, that seems to have something to do with height. If I flip it, the people with version A are slightly taller and the version with the, you know, the other version are slightly shorter. And so gradually we're mapping out, but not us, because we're not smart enough, but using kind of AI machine learning methods, we're mapping out uh, what all these different lo loci or locations on your genome are doing and how they're influencing the phenotypes. So most people have a pretty simplistic framework in their heads about genotypic variation and how it expresses itself as a phenotype. You hear like, what's the gene for height? What's the gene for intelligence? But these are poly almost entirely polygenetic traits. Um, how complex is something like height versus something like intelligence? Right. How many genes? Is it is it simply the number of how many genes? And and also, isn't there also kind of like um, an almost like a cumulative component where like if you have more of one thing that that directly leads to more of the phenotype, so more of some particular gene for height actually leads to some quantifiable change in the centimeters or inches of height that the person has? Yeah. So first, some of what you're discussing is the, the sort of technical term is genetic architecture. So in other words, what is it about the specific you know, DNA that is influencing those things? At one extreme, you can have very simple things where like there's one mutation and based on that one mutation, there could be some crippling, very bad outcome, right? But the, the architecture is very simple. It's like on, off, right? 99.9% .9 of the population does not have this mutation. The 0.1% that has the mutation, wow, their breast cancer risk just went up by 10x or something, or they, you know, some serious problem. That's the simple end of genetic architecture. The complex end of genetic architecture is Wow, there are 10,000 different loci scattered over all of your 23 chromosomes, each of which has a little bit of an effect on your height. Some of them are located inside of genes. Some of them are located outside of genes. Hmm. But the, the algorithm, when you run it, the machine learning picks up the locations of all these 10,000 and builds a little formula or algorithm that allows you, given the DNA of a person, the algorithm predicts their height plus or minus a few centimeters. And so we in 2017 were the first to actually work this out. So we were the first to build an accurate predictor for comp a complex trait like height. And the accuracy is plus or minus a few centimeters. So that's what kind of led to the founding of the company. Um, this was a culmination of a long program, because I told you I started getting interested in genomics like around 2010. And during that time, as I had thought, like more and more data started accumulating to the point where you could routinely analyze hundreds of thousands or half a million or a million people at a time. And you could run that on a big supercomputer and you could eventually, quote, solve a trait to get be able to get fairly precise predictions. And so that that was the research program that I was engaged in during those years. I, I, I was still doing physics, but but this was the sort of main like non-physics activity that I was engaged in. So height is probably a good um, variable to start with because there's probably a lot of data on it. Yep. Given where machine learning and neural nets are today, is is the major bottleneck to solving this problem primarily around data and sourcing high quality data and enough of it? Yes. So I would claim uh, again, like all these things are frontier research. So you might find a researcher who disagrees with me, but I would claim that there's pretty strong evidence that the algorithms we have are good enough. The main limitation to progress 
is the availability of enough data because these algorithms are very, very data hungry. And so in the case of height, we already have pretty good height predictors. That's because um, almost everybody who gets genotyped, it's very easy to get their height. You can just kind of ask them, how tall are you? And self-report is not completely accurate, but it's, you know, it's fairly accurate. Whereas other traits like cognitive ability, there's very little labeled data. There's very little data where you have the genome of the person and you have a high quality measurement of their cognitive scores. Like you have their military I, you know, uh, uh, ability scores or you have their SAT score, you have something. Very little of the genomic data that we have is labeled in that way, has that phenotype information. Whereas a lot of it, you might be able to look at their health records and figure out what subset of these people had breast cancer or what subset of these people had prostate cancer. That's uh, much easier to get that data. The hardest data to get is behavioral cognitive data. So I want to ask you more about that, but let's bring it back to genomic prediction, the, your company. What do you guys, what are the services that you guys offer? Are they all related to IVF and embryo selection and, um, and pre-genetic screening? Yes. So genomic prediction is focused on uh, embryo selection in IVF. Um, it is now pretty standard in the United States for embryos. Once you um, go through the IVF process, so you're extracting eggs from the mother-to-be, you are fertilizing them with sperm from the father, and then you let them grow to a certain size. And then before you freeze them, it's normal to freeze them because then that gives the mother's body some period of time to recover from the process of egg retrieval and hormonal stimulation. Then the eggs are, I mean, the, the embryos are frozen and you make a selection of which ones you want to transfer and they're transferred later and hopefully a pregnancy results. But before the freezing happens, it is now pretty standard at the IVF clinic for them to take a small biopsy from something called the trophectoderm, which is the part of the embryo that's going to become the placenta. So it's not your kid, it's the placenta, but it has the same DNA as your kid. So that sample is taken out and it's routinely sent to a lab for genotyping. The most common and primitive genotyping is just to check whether, for example, there's a chromosome problem. Like, is there an extra copy of chromosome 21, which could lead to Down syndrome, that kind of thing. That's the sort of low tech stuff. The higher tech stuff would be a, a whole genome genotype of the embryo and then uh, a company like Genomic Prediction can compute all kinds of predictions. Like, is this embryo an outlier in risk for any of these 20 disease conditions? Um, and, and that is reported back to the IVF physician. So what differentiates a company like yours from other big players in the space, like a Natera or like a genomic or like a um, um, Cooper Genomics or something like that? Yeah. So those guys are our competitors. So Natera and Cooper will are able to do the more, I, I almost said the word primitive, but the, the older style uh, types of genotyping, like they can check whether there's a chromosomal abnormality. They can look for a particular mutation that might lead to some really bad consequence, but they're not able to get enough information from the whole genome to compute these polygenic scores. They are not able to compute polygenic scores because they do not measure the genome of the embryo with the level of precision that we do. So how do you, how are you able to back up a claim like that? And is it that they don't, cause so this also raises the question of what's the limiting factor here? Is it the science and the technology or is it the regulations? Like I'm not fully familiar with what regulations allow you guys to actually communicate to patients. So do you know for a fact that these other companies don't measure this stuff, even though both of you guys can't share it with patients? Or are you actually able to, able to share it with patients? So the, the actual wet lab genotyping process, so in other words, once they or we receive the biopsy, so it's a few cells that are preserved, and these cells can be shipped. The, the DNA is very stable, so it can be shipped. So one lab can handle biopsies that are sent from anywhere in the world. So we, we are all, in our lab in New Jersey, we are processing samples from hundreds of clinics all around the world. What's done with that sample is different at Cooper 
than with us. So we're the first to basically develop a process where you can amplify the DNA sufficiently that you can do a whole genome genotype as opposed to just specifically looking for chromosomal abnormalities, which is the most common kind of test that say Cooper specializes in. But we compete with Cooper on that most common kind of test, which is the looking for chromosome abnormalities. It's called PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. Hmm. We compete with them on that. We would say our aneuploidy test is much more accurate than theirs because we get so much more information uh, from the genome. And uh, it's that extra information that also allows us to compute the polygenic scores. So I'm going to move us to the second hour, Stephen. And uh, there's still a lot more that I want to discuss specifically in the field of genomics, including wearable tech, because a lot of people now have this uh, these technologies, you know, I, Apple iWatch, the Whoop, and all sorts of other stuff, the, the Aura Ring, that are connect, collecting for the first time longitudinal data that doesn't have to be as accurate in the absolute, but simply the fact that there is a baseline and now you're able to measure relative differences, like it's a huge game changer. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on how you think that is going to change the game when it comes to, to to genomic science and what's going on here too. I also want to talk about when and how you see the the uh, the science and the regulations more importantly progressing when it comes to uh, selecting for certain traits beyond simply selecting out ones that are dangerous. And then when and how do we get into a into the field of quote designer babies where people are actually making changes to the DNA. I think, Oh, I can't remember the name of the doctor, but there was some guy in Hong Kong in 2019 who did this. He, yeah. uh, if I'm not mistaken, he wanted to impart, um, HIV immunity onto his patients or, or they had requested it. And there was a lot, this raises all sorts of social and ethical questions, which is again, something I want to talk about. I also want to talk about dating apps and how the, the, there's there's two sides of the conversation around dating apps. One is like how much uh, how much information and what kind of information are these companies already um, collecting, and and why are we not hearing more about it? I actually tried. I re reached out to Hinge and to Bumble and a bunch of these companies years ago because when I started the podcast, this was one of my one of my areas of focus, and I just couldn't make a lot of hay or headway. Um, I, they were very secretive around it, and I'm all, so I'm also curious, kind of like how in the future dating apps, uh, the service gets coupled with insights about each, each other's genomes. And do we get to this crazy sort of Gattaca world? And how quickly do we get there? And this is also going to get us into a conversation about artificial intelligence, which you know a lot about. Of course, AI is central to the work that you do at Genomic Prediction. And it's also something that is very interesting in its own right. And we're going to have an opportunity to talk about that. AI, um, its effects on, you know, on on the private sector, uh, how it influences geopolitics and geopolitical competition, uh, AI risks. Like, there's just a lot there to talk about, Stephen. So, for anyone who is, for anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is a listener. I'm going to say that again. So, uh, <laughs> for anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Stephen, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Stephen, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed.